today's topic, as you see, that community total sanitation challenges of nationwide scaling up and sustainability. You see, today we are here in, uh, in June 2015, and in a few months, you know, MBG is, is closing. The dream is falling apart. The dream that started Millennium Development Goal, Goal 7, that halving the, you know, the population of the world to, and, and reducing the, the problem of openification to half by 2015. 15 years gone. In general, Africa has failed, you know, more or less failed, uh, you know, off track. It's not going to happen. Same in many countries in Asia. So, where do we stand now? We are going into SDG. Uh, MDG started in 2000 and in 2015, we see that many countries really, you know, could not achieve the goal and rather far behind the target set for the Millennium Development Goal. And, uh, but now SDG is going to start and going to look at it till 2030 and uh, 2030, so another 15 years. What do we learn from this? Now, at this stage, I'm trying to discuss with our experiences from different countries in Asia and Africa, particularly, that what did we learn? In, uh, if this, you know, I'll show you in the presentation that we really did learn a lot. When MDG started in 2000, but CLTS, you know, was evolved really, uh, you know, from 1999, 2000, around that time, but really started working, scaling it. I mean, trying to introduce in countries 2002, 3, around that time. Because, you know, it took some time to really develop it. It was mostly in Bangladesh and then brought it to India and then to Cambodia, Indonesia, like that it happened. But CLTS approach was brought to Africa, brought in the continent of Africa in 2007. So they really got 2007, you could say 2000, from 2007, 8, it started rolling it out. So they got the last few seven, eight years to really move. But in that time, during that time, what they did is definitely far, far better than what Asia did. So now people were thinking that, you know, whether it will work at all in Africa, but it worked far better than how it worked in Asia. So then I'm going to, you know, explain something that the Asia, Africa, why did it work in many countries in Africa and why it did not, or what are the problems and prospects, you know, we'll talk about that. But the question comes that if CLTS was introduced in Africa first, at least personally I, feel, I believe, I feel, at least a couple of countries would have been declared open defecation free in Africa by now. <coughs> now, see, Western Central Africa, Sierra Leone, Chad, you know, these countries, they did really, really very, very good. But what really happened, you know, in the initial stage, when we started working with the CLTS, mostly they started counting villages, open defecation free villages. Now in Africa, more than 30 countries, now already now in, in Asia, Africa, Latin America combined, more than 64 countries have been, have introduced CLTS and rolling out, what did we learn? See, we, uh, I'm coming back to that point here, you know, that you can see some of these countries, that, you know, of course I said, had CLTS been introduced in Africa first, my personal feeling is that by now we would have celebrated a couple of countries completely open defecation free in Africa. Uh, that's the feeling. But you know, Africa got to, uh, you know, the less number of years, uh, but did pretty well. Now, competition amongst the countries and organization achieving ODF villages, that competition is still going on. While that went on, you know, like, as I said, more than 60 countries, 64 countries ruling out CLTS. And all of them have hundreds or thousands of ODF villages. But the moment you ask them, how many of you have ODF districts or ODF regions or ODF states? The answer is no. So by doing that, you know, I mean that critical mass of, if you fail, we, but we, you know, coming back to Madagascar, you know, Madagascar, they said village and then Fukuntani 
and Fukuntani after that it's commune and then districts and then region. But there are hundreds of Fukuntanis which are ODF and then uh, ODF communes are there, ODF districts. While looking into those things, you know, we found that the moment you involve the local government, the Fukuntani government or the commune or the region or the district, you gain, you add so much into the whole process. Whereas, if you still continue villages, you are only involving the local self-government of the village and the local panchayat or whatever it is. You are missing them all. So that's a great institutional miss that we discovered. And uh, institutional and scaling up. See, uh, <clears throat> from a few hundred ODF villages to the whole country, whole nation and whole district, why it is not there? Then we realized that it was there was a problem of institutionalization. And many NGOs, international NGOs or projects or programs, you know, they work in their own areas, on their limited areas. But who is responsible for the whole nation? The highest political leadership, the prime ministers, the presidents, the ministers, the regional ministers, the state ministers, you know, they are the ones, you know. When we went back to them and to understand that what is their take on this, many of them were simply foreigners in their own country. They really didn't know much about what is that big thing going on and what was their role in that. The question naturally came that if hundreds of villages could stop diarrhea and death, diarrheal death and cholera, typhoid death of the kids, and why not the same thing without asking any direct uh, infrastructure or any monetary support from the government. What was that that stopped them, to, you know, the, the country to spread it to the, all over the all over the country? And why in other areas uh, the, the the mortality, child mortality is going on? There are a huge, uh, you know, case studies which is coming up, you know, which is brought up to the political leadership of the nations, you know, that like in Chad, in, uh, in Mali, uh, now we are hearing from uh, Liberia that out of the 79 open defecation free villages in Liberia, there is not a single case of Ebola. And those villages are in the middle of the Ebola uh, endemic area. And the same thing has happened, but this, this needs to be looked at. This is not nothing, you know, this is just an information. And a couple of weeks back, we were in uh, the assistant minister of Liberia was there and he, he, he confirmed that and he said, yes, it is. But we have to find out what it is there. You know, there, there are there are other causes. But what has come up and established by the uh, by the by the uh, country's uh, government report of the health department in uh, Chad, in 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 Mali, that in cholera endemic zones, you know, uh, the, the, there was not a single case of cholera in the uh, in the ODF villages. So those things are there. So now the question is coming that. Uh, is, the God, is, is the Prime Minister or the President or the Minister, they hate other villages and let the, uh, allow them to be, the kids to die? Or what is it? I mean, if they don't want it, whose responsibility it is that you, uh, you, uh, you, know, you don't spread it? People uh, have innovated their things. Or should the community be blamed that you, know, you, you spread it? Is there a role for the government? So that's a bigger question. Now, looking at this, you can see that there are three graphs, you know, you, you can see that these are the different countries. This one is that before the starting of NDG in 2000, where were they? And uh, kind of, and what progress they have made over the last 15 years. And the third bar diagram, what was the, the NDG goal, the target for that particular country? You can see that the, by and large, the target is missed out. But at the same time, you will also find that something is reduced, you know. There are countries where open defecators are increasing, you know. It's, it's, it's also the number of open defecators increasing. But this is not the current one, because this is based on 2010, uh, 2012 data on, uh, you know, the, <coughs> the UNICEF uh, WHO data. So this is superimposed. We try to put it together, and in the in the last, uh, the, you know, the uh, Africa Sand Conference, this was you know, displayed in a huge map, and many countries came. 
and they saw in the ministers, in the ministerial dialogue. If you look at that, this is the number of communities, ODF communities, and the ODF population living in there. Uh, it's, it's a huge number, but this data is not here, actually. But you get a picture that how, on an average, they have missed it, and then there are, uh, again, this data is also not together, you know, it's largely from UNICEF. But there are, uh, you know, there are voids because there are many other agencies working together and putting all the data together, you know, this picture will probably change. But this gives you some idea. Now, <coughs> coming back to Africa again, you know, open defecation free communities since 2010. Uh, you know, 7 to 100, one, uh, 101 to 250, and 1,000 and above to 8,000. You can see these colors, there are countries, you know, those who have made a significant progress and, you know, still moving on. Uh, now, coming back to these questions, and when these questions were asked, that if there are success stories and, you know, the islands of excellence in every country, hundreds of them, and there, there is a direct health impact showing it, then whose responsibility it is to scale it up? What, why are we waiting for? Do we have a protocol for the whole ODF nation? Do we have a roadmap? Do we have a funding clearly, you know, the budget allo allocation for that? Do we have an implementation strategy? What are we doing? And are we not, why are we not using them as the, the learning showcase and, you know, build it around it to declare the whole nation as open defecation free, to reduce, to change this story? Now, looking at this, this again, you will see that depending on, this is one, there are factors, you know, I'm just talk, trying to talk about that. This is a country where the responsibility of sanitation, Ethiopia, it, 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 it is on the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Health. Kenya, uh, it's Ministry of Health, you know, Public Health Health. There are, you look at the, you know, the, the countries and you will find there is a great deviation, you know, like the Ministry of Health in some countries responsible for uh, public health, sanitation, again in some other countries is rural development, water ministry, engineering. So that again says that the, if it is the Ministry of Health, definitely they are looking at the outcome. The number of <coughs> incidents of diarrhea is, is it reducing, and the child mortality and etc, etc. Human health outcome. Whereas others might look at the infrastructures created, latrine built, toilet built. And the usage, there is a huge disconnect between the ministries. What is the usage pattern and what is the outcome uh, or the health outcome of that? So these are some of the disconnects. But Namibia, Botswana, Lesotho, there, all the ministers are ready. These are small countries, less than, you know, one or one, two million people. But they are trying to now jump into it, looking at these things. So uh, <coughs> now, CLTS, you know, as in Asia, if you look at it, first introduced in Bangladesh, and this country, Bangladesh, sanitation access increased from, you know, you know, around 30, 30, 40 percent to 97 percent. So this is one country going to declare open defecation free nation by the end of this year. And the next year's the SACOSAN, South Asia Conference on Sanitation, will be held in Dhaka. And the first Sakusan I remember, Robert, it was uh, in, uh, which year was that? Uh, 2003. 2003, and that's where CLTS, you know, we brought more than 50 natural leaders from the open defecation free villages. And ministers came, that was the very first Sakusan uh, South Asia conference, and CLTS emerged actually. And those uh, natural community, natural leaders played a very, very important role. They brought their, uh, you know, models and everything. There was huge interactions. Ministers came from different countries in Asia, and today the second, the next time Bangladesh is going to host the next Sakusan in 2016 early. So that's a great, and this should be celebrated. How Bangladesh did it? What are the different factors that contributed? What was the role of the government, and how now the whole rural Bangladesh is going to say? And now Bangladesh was one of those countries where the diarrhea death and incidence of diarrhea was one of the highest in the world. And that is why ICDDRB, International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, was based in there. So now what are they going to do? Probably send it to India, maybe, that institute. You know, I mean, it's a question is, 
I mean, that, and that story is changing fast. So people can't do it. You know, that's, that's a bigger question. Nepal reduced oversimplification from 84% in 1990 to 40% in 2012. And others include Pakistan, Indonesia, Cambodia, and, you know, there is a great need for India. Uh, but uh, because in India alone, the number of open difficulties is more than, far more than the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, all countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, uh, government use subsidy-driven approach. Initially, what the challenges CLT has felt in the last, that CLT has faced in, the, in over the last 12, 14 years, yeah, uh, <coughs> you know, had been to fight with the, with the subsidy, that subsidy is needed, people are poor, give them money. It took some time, uh, Laya, it's, uh, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> so that's, that's a, uh, that was an issue. And then uh, infrastructure, prescription, subsidized, prescribed, and top-down approach. People are poor, give them toilets. People are fooled, they don't understand, teach them hygiene education. They can't construct toilet, you know, so give them engineering design. That's, that was the thing, but it's completely proved wrong, you know. And the people had the capability to do it. They had produced lots of local models and everything using locally and low cost models and everything. And they could change them. And what really happened that toilet was, you know, thought as the, you know, was considered as the, uh, the solution, main solution to the whole problem. It was not. It was the collective hygiene, collective hygiene behavior change of the community. Toilet, I may not have a toilet, doesn't matter, but I'm not allowed to defecate in the open. I have to use my friends or my, 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 my uh, relative's toilet, and others, the whole community will, will help me. And, uh, that's how it went on, you know. No open defecation, all the toilets are fly-proof, and everybody was in hands with soap, or ass, or whatever. That's the thing, the fecal oral contamination must be stopped. And we got the, the whole, so that was a struggle. Now, policy. Many countries in Africa, I will come back, that they saw that something is working in our country. Villages or, uh, or, or uh, you know, the, the sub-districts or wherever it is, is working. Let's bring it to the policy. And they quickly brought it to the policy. Many countries still uh, debating whether this is good or that is good, that is bad and this and that. The couple of months back I was in, in China and uh, Professor Lurong from the, uh, the Sichuan University and he said, look, in China, we see that something is working, and we follow and we apply. But Dr. Kaur, in your country, the debate goes on, that which is, this is good or that is good. I think it's correct, he was correct. So in our country, debate is still going on, whether subsidy or no subsidy, which is, and it might can continue for another 20 years, but by the time, you know, millions of, you know, thousands and thousands of kids will be, will be dead. You see, but whose responsibility it is? It's good to have a debate. It's open democracy. That's fine. That's fine. You know, but at the cost of what? Every hour, every day, hundreds of thousands of kids are dying. Actually, now every 15 seconds. So these are some of the questions you know, that we have to see. And, and now some of those countries in Africa, they found that it is working to change it. At least 15 countries I know very well. I know the ministers and all that. They said they brought it to their own national policy making, uh, you know, the, the place and they said, let's stop subsidy and let's invest that money in community empowerment, local community empowerment. We need money, but, and then bring the whole thing, let the community change it and then bring the support after that. Because it will, but change it from a supply driven approach to a demand driven approach. Community demands it, you know, they said, we need this, we need that. And no one formula, no one solution that build this particular kind of toilet. No, it's a whole basket of choice. As the demand grows, people demand this and that and different kinds. This whole mosaic of, you know, choice comes up. But it all goes to one trying to, uh, you know, achieve one thing, that the public good, there is no open defecation in our community and we don't eat each other's shit. So that's the, that's the major question comes up. So that was the thing. Then sanitation was, you know, rested in the ministries, uh, you know, focus with infrastructure, as I told you, focus on toilet construction still continue. You know, some, as I said, some nations quickly realized, yeah. So, uh, and then interinstitutional in coordination, I said that, you know, because unless you have a good coordination between the 
the ministry that is responsible to measure the health outcome of any intervention with the other ministries, those who are responsible for implementation, you can't just go there. So, uh, <clears throat> ODF target and roadmap. Now, innovative scaling up strategies, what we learned that some of the countries I said in Africa, like in Madagascar, they have the regional plan, they have a ODF region, they have got a roadmap and ODF region, ODF districts. Those plans are there. And putting all those plans together is the ODF nations roadmap. And there is one country in Africa, Madagascar, they have printed out, they have, you know, uh, they have released their open defecation free Madagascar roadmap with the plan and everything and what different agencies. There is a complete focus on convergence and that has happened from the success of the communities at the ground level and that has mobilized the, the president and the prime minister and uh, last month I was uh, in Washington DC uh, with the, the first lady of Malawi and the first lady of Madagascar, both of them were there and they were pleasing that, you know, because of open defecation, it is the women and the children who suffers most and, you know, uh, you know calling for a, a worldwide, uh, you know, uh, support to, to stop open defecation, which is also a part of the SDG. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, transforming the mindset of the donors, that had been also a challenge in the last few years and the country is like, Ghana, they stood out against the World Bank, they said, no, we have seen this, you've got to change it, and that has happened. And no supply or pan or this and that, but bringing the money, we, we want the money, but you know, it, the, we, have to, we, we have to invest it the way it works. And Chad, the European Union, they, they said that there were a huge money coming in, but for toilet construction, they would transform that. Like that, there are many, many instances and examples that we have learned. That, uh, but it was all possible once the, once the government has a clear national policy and that policy says we do this and we do this and we do this because we have learned it and we don't do this. So it's not a free for all. Any funding support that comes has to follow the national uh, strategy. And uh, now champions and leaders, we have seen that you know, many champions and leaders you know, from different levels, not only in the community level, but the district, region, at the national level, ministers, big champions. And then those uh, also the traditional leaders like Chief Macha in, uh, in, uh, in Zambia or, or chiefs in Malawi, they are, many of them are very famous in that part of the world. So government supported them and, and they saw that, you know, let's use that any network of people or the society that really works. Malawi, Madagascar, Zambia. Uh, <clears throat> appropriate enabling environment, you know, which is which is very very important. And I will uh, skip some of these things. You know, uh, you look at these. They, I'm showing you some of the champions who made it. They, these are not like the the natural leaders of CLTS in a village. This is the the minister in Ghana. Uh, that's the president of Madagascar there. Yeah and uh, the Minister of uh, Water, Minister Dilu, and uh, this is the Vice uh, Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Timor Leste, uh, the President of uh, Kiribati. You know, they are, when they jumped into it, things started spreading in a completely different mode. And, you know, people who were, CLTS facilitators were airlifted by helicopters and brought into different islands and island by island, you know, started cleaning it up. So, once you involve them, we do not know that how much you get it. So that's the, because there is a national commitment for that. And uh, <clears throat> now what is really important is these three things, you know. Attitude behavior change, you know, our personal, professional and institutional attitude, what Robert says. And then the CLTS tools and triggering and, and, and techniques. People think, people thought one challenge we saw, it's only triggering, triggering, triggering and that's all. And that is CLTS, that it is not, definitely not. And that's why in many countries we also saw there are so many villages triggered, but the open defecation free villages, the number of that ODF villages are so low. So pre-triggering, triggering, post-triggering follow-up and post-ODF actions. These are extremely important and these are very, very well defined. What are the things that we do? And many countries have to really, uh, you know, go in their institutions and whoever has done that, they're getting their success. And the most important, another important thing is enabling environment, which is policy context, 
the interinstitutional coordination, as I explained to that, where is the policy? Is that a free for all or you have a policy? Which, which side you know, it focuses? And national protocol of the budget. Are we depending on only on outsider's budget or there is something that we know that this doesn't cost you money, but is there a commitment for the country? The essential convergence is needed. That is very, very important. Now, the broad dimensions of at scale, the policy the, the, and the political leadership, are they triggered? Then monitoring, what kind of monitoring are we looking at? Um, measuring counting toilets or counting ODF or counting ODF communities, what are we counting? ODF protocol and then budgeting and planning, human resources, and partners and capacity and post ODF sustainability. Are they sliding back? What is going on and why? You know, so these are very, very important things. I'm not going into detail of that. We are developing a tool called RAP. I'm quickly going to come on that, you know, CLTS Rapid Appraisal Protocol. CRAC is a name like this shit, you know, so it's, so we have to, so the innovative funding, see, innovative strategies, innovative funding mechanisms are emerging. The Global Sanitation Fund of, you know, supported by the WACC, Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council. This is a unique funding mechanism, which we are learning that, you know, how it's, it's, a, it's a competitive funding and how it has really uh, triggered lots of things and brought different institutions. There is no one particular approach but different things. So that's a new funding exclusively on sanitation then they are following on, on, on sanitation, the CLTS. Emergence of new funds in mechanism, institutional triggering. I'm going to talk about that. What is an institutional triggering? This is, we are very soon going to come up with this, this book. Now, it's not like CLTS triggering in a village. But it's an institutional triggering. We call it, it started from institutional open defecation. You know, I used to say that people will stop their open defecation in the community. But the institutional shift is very difficult to continue, it's difficult to stop. Because nobody is together. Uh, nobody, you know, comes together on a common platform. Somebody is trying this and this and that. And as a result, as I said, the debate going on, you know, which is best, whether you are right or I am right, this goes on and on and on, you know. And at the end of it, so triggering the highest political decision makers leadership. What stops the spread and scaling up of a few hundred villages to the whole country? In India, we have Himachal Pradesh, which is walk along the, the, the go along the rural areas of Himachal Pradesh. It's open defecation free, largely. Why it is not the other states are coming up? There are districts in Maharashtra, districts in Haryana. What stops them to take it to all over the country? So, but debate is good, but you know. What stops it? And who is responsible? And who, uh, who is to be blamed? And why it is, uh, who is responsible to spread the success of the entire region, to the entire region, or entire state? Now, is there any clear roadmap for that implementation plan or budget protocol? These are some of the questions raised. Now, quickly one or two slides. This is from, from Ghana, in one region, in Ghana, uh, last month. You know, people, these are the, the whole region. And in that, there are 21 districts. All the districts are the senior district officers who are standing on the map. So they are standing on the map. And, this is, and what is the status there? How many ODM villages? Nil. How many there? 300. So everybody give him a clap because he is difficulting to open. You know, his district is the worst district. It's just like the CLTS kind of figuring. And that man for the first time wakes up. And these are the, the, uh, the district heads up. Now, to see that, <laughs> when this is, this is from the northern region, 21 districts in the northern region of, of Ghana. And when the senior officers, they stood on the map in different side, and he saw from zero to 250 ODF villages. And I said, whose region is this? The minister was brought in. And I said, minister, is that, they are the heads of the district. Whose region? He said, yes, it's my region. And he is recharging them. He said, I want to see that, you know, this is not the story. From zero to 250, how come? And he never knew these things, you know. The whole triggering begins. And everybody blaming, and then it begins the discussion. Yes, Minister, what about our budget? Where is the budget from the region? Where it is, are we, this district is supported by UNICEF, and this is not. So, I mean, all that question comes up. This is all, this institutional triggering raises that question, gets into there, the protocol, the roadmap, and whether the district heads are involved in it. As a result, 
The, what is the outcome of an institutional trigger? A village triggering outcome is an ODF plan. Let's make it open defecation free. Here, this is the minister, regional minister of, of the Volta region, regional minister of Volta region of Ghana. She said, I'm there. I'm going to see Dr. Kaur and let's see how that. That's the kind of thing. So making in front of all the heads of the districts, you know, the, you, can, you can call them the, uh, the, uh, they, they call them the district heads of the district assembly and the, uh, the political heads and all that. So that's the thing and the roadmap and they sit down together and they start making the plan. Now, this is uh, in the last Africa Sand, this is the minister of Mozambique. This is the county minister from Kenya, one of the county ministers. This is the minister from Madagascar and this is the minister from Zambia. So they all presented and he felt so embarrassed because in Mozambique, you know, they are not into all this. But what he said, the minister said at the end, was quite inspiring. And he said, I'm going to do this. And he called his officers and directors, everybody was there. And now I'm hearing they're going to really move on. So telling them that what is that institutional triggering and how it has to be really uh, you know, moved on. Because it doesn't happen just like that. You need a systematic approach. And uh, so what do we learn from uh, for the SDG? What do we, what do uh, we know, approach, how do we do that in the SDG? Precisely, ministerial dialogue, you know, uh, ministerial dialogue and ministerial forum that we are trying to make it, call all the ministers and take them to different countries, you know, in Africa where the success, uh, you know, has been, you know, demonstrated pretty well. Crap tools, you know, and then institutional freedom, some of these things. What is crap? The CLTS Rapid Appraisal Protocol. What is it? We're going to scale with quality. As I said, that different countries in Africa, they are not same. The quality wise, the scaling up quality and everything is not same. So this is a tool, it's a diagnostic tool. We are developing very soon, it will be available with the UNICEF and CLTS Foundation together. We are trying to, uh, to, to develop that, which will be, could be applied to any country in a rapid you know, uh, it's a quick and dirty kind of a quick understanding of the uh, of the quality of CLTS implementation, the institutional protocol, the roadmap, institutional license, involvement of the top political leadership, policy, you know, budget protocol. Is it all there full or it is just working only CLTS, CLTS, CLTS in some villages and the rest of the things, you know. So it diagnoses the health of CLTS program in a particular country or institutional organization context, say what are they, uh, you know, implementing CLTs in more than 30 countries, which countries, which are those countries where it is much better, where it is not so much plan international, anything that can use that. Institutional triggering is an extractive tool, it's not, a, it's not an extractive tool, it's a participatory exercise to trigger. I was showing you some examples, strengths and weaknesses of various stakeholders. And the course correction, of course, so now, <coughs> uh, there is a wide variation, I told you that. Uh, <coughs> and anyway, I will skip some of these things, you know, the roadmaps, planning and budgeting, CLTS protocol, access and partnership, monitoring. So we need to look into all these things because CLTS protocol is only that how it is being implemented is not enough. Because the first, the, the slide I was showing, the enabling environment, that is very, very important. And now, you see, <coughs> certification and then due to collapse of the peaks and new families coming up and other kind of things there is a you know if you if you if you look at this book uh, the uh, the sheet matters you know edited by professor Lala Mehta uh, in the early stage we did that uh, there was a study this was a study uh, which looked into three countries Indonesia Bangladesh and India on, on that what has happened after CLTS on, in terms of sustainability. There are very interesting uh, findings in that. But we got lots of findings, but we see that some way down and mostly are like this. But what is that protocol of the government protocol to address some of these? To address some of these? Is that systematic? Or, you know, the, the linking with the market, availability, uh, funding, you know, what kind of, uh, or 
How, how, why this is all happening? Is there a, a floating population, migratory population, looking into all these things? And this, and how, to what extent, this is also related to bad practice of CLTS, not so good practice of CLTS. So, uh, now, <clears throat> this is also happening. Like, this is a village, uh, you know, in, 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 in Ghana, as I said, CLTS was triggered Everyone constructed beautiful toilets and with the community constructed on their own. You can see the gas pipe with the net and mosquito proof and everything. And when I went there, I saw in front of every house there are three toilets like this. After six months came UNICEF and gave this free of cost. So they abandoned this, they came into here. And then after one year came World Vision, they gave this one, the twin <laughs> feet. They abandoned this, they went to that one. So in front of all houses, it was so funny. And this is a unique example of institutional open defecation. And you know, where one institution doesn't know what the other, because it all relates to a national protocol and strategy. You cannot, we follow this, we don't follow this or this, by bringing all the actors together on a common platform and trying to say that our target is not your area, my area, but an ODF nation. That's what we are trying to do. Actually, and that's the protocol, what support we need. So, now the villagers came from other villages and said, sir, we have done this, when can we get this? Because we are waiting for this, actually. So, you know, it's a kind of a message that is being spread. So, I think I stop here at the moment and I will spend some time for question answers. Yeah? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.